So, so uh, welcome to your favorite CEO, uh, Applied Science, right? CEOs do this, they, they put up things that nobody can read and they feel like they've accomplished something, right? And um, now, I've been doing technology behind the scenes since Apple II, okay? And, uh, and I still have my Apple II. Okay, it was, it's upgraded to Apple II Plus, still works. <laughs> Bought my first company with it. And, uh, and, and, and but, but everywhere I go, I disavow all knowledge about technology. Why you were watching us up there do all kinds of cool stuff, I'm not sure what we did. But the good news is I have, um, I have brought primitive material. Those things to which some of us feel much more at home, and, um, and so, so what we're going to talk about is business ethics and immersive learning, and we're going to talk about it in the context of culture building. Okay, now, I had the privilege of sitting in on the last day and a half, and it was just delightful. It was, it was you know, just, you know, the world that you are, are engaged in is very important. <laughs> And, and people like me may or may not act like it's important, but it's a very important world. We, as people who run and build companies, wrestle with building cultures and preserving cultures. And one of the themes that pops up as we work with digital and digital related material is it's really about people. It's really about people. Now we wrestle with the fact that people need knowledge, they need data, they need analytics, they need training, they need to expanding their exposure and they need to understand what's going on both in their world and their client's world. The presentation before was, was splendid on, on you know, the academic environment. You know, we hire people all the time and, and we have oversight and we have undersight and we have round sight and we do 360 studies and do all this cool stuff, but it's about people. And so as we go through this, this theme is about people. And how do we build organizations where people can be more effective? Because remember, as a CEO, your goal is never to make people unsuccessful. Okay, so make your competition unsuccessful. That's your job. But everybody else, you want to make successful. You want your customers to be successful. You want your vendors to be successful. You want your speakers to be successful, you know, stop littering, things like that. Now, but in particular, you want your people, your employees, to be successful. That's your passion. And anybody who says it's not your passion doesn't understand what CEOs do. That's our passion. We wake up every day and we go to sleep and we worry about are people and are they successful and do we have the tools to make them successful? Now you look at the larger clients that you have and the people that you work with, we're talking hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, how does Mike Duke, he and I swapped emails yesterday about another situation. He has a million people. He's the chairman of Walmart. How do you, chairman of Walmart, make a million people successful? And I will tell you, that's his passion. That's why he's chairman of Walmart. It's not because he's trying to get rich. Okay, now we all say, oh, yeah, yeah, right, you know, big CEO, you know, fat cats. Okay, I tell, we'll just tell you that that's why what you do is important because you provide a new tool to the toolkit of making people successful. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's look at the problem, you know, and then we're going to look a little bit about why culture for business ethics. I mean, why does it turn into a culture situation? We'll do a little skit and have a little fun. And we're gonna look at an immersive learning exercise, okay? That I had the privilege of working with a client next learn and developing an immersive learning exercise. So we'll look at that and, and that'll be a part of this whole idea of how do we do applications. Now, you've all very lucky, you've never heard me speak before, but for those who would have, I can go on all day, but they only gave me an hour. So that's gonna be a problem, okay? Now here's the problem. The problem is cultures are not static. They are not static. And let's just go to the papers and see what we've got. 
Okay, so I have here your Vader, very favorite rank, the USA Today. Okay, now this is a business paper. All right, in other words, it's a paper printed by business people, if you don't mind, it's all in the corner. Um, paper, you know, business people created this paper. This was not created by journalists. That's why there are, you know, very few things that are more than a paragraph or two. You know, the ultimate soundbite responding to the fact that we're all moved into soundbite, which is good for you because, right, sims are soundbites put in, in a flow that communicate, all right? And so, so welcome to this. Now, any ethics in here for the uh, business, uh, you know, the culture thing? Uh, let's see, we have a bankruptcy. Bankruptcies are interesting. There are a whole bunch of ethical questions about bankruptcy, whether you believe it or not, everybody who goes through one and thinks about one does weigh the balance of, you know, what's going to happen, you know, people are going to get fired, that's not going to get paid, and all kinds of stuff, you know, we're pulling up the white flag. We don't like bankruptcies, but, uh, but there it is, so there's an ethical setting. Uh, let's see, oh, let's see, we have a cruise captain. Yeah. Whoa, yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff there, okay. Uh, oh, here's a fun one, Department of Education. We talked about education a few minutes ago. Needs to create a manual. Oh, a manual. Now that really lifts it up, doesn't it? I mean, you know, people like me are feeling good already. We can hand these out, make you read them. I mean, Department of Education, everybody knows how to read. This is not going to be a problem. And we know that when you read something, you for sure remember it forever. Right? Right. But well, what's the manual for? fight cheating. Uh, is cheating an ethical problem? Who would think? Uh, and who's cheating? If I doubt everybody's cheating. The teachers cheat on behalf of the students, the students cheat on behalf of the teachers, I mean everybody's cheating. I mean, goodness, what are we going to do? Okay, so that one's interesting. All right, let's see. Oh, we have a hearse. A hearse. Sounds very bad. Transported JFK's body. Sounds like murder. That's an ethical problem, isn't it? Okay, so not bad, not bad. E-textbooks probably not. Oh, look at that. This is guy's favorite, right? <laughs> Super Bowl model, super sexy. Okay, draws in, you know. Here we go. Okay, there's no ethics there, though. Okay, but you can see what I mean. You can see what I mean. The challenge is everywhere. And, and, and we just need to feel that, that you know, the culture is, is, it needs it. Now, this is something that I know all of you are going to rush right out and sign up for. This is the CPA Journal. Yes, exactly. Talks about accounting and taxes, but it also talks about building professional practices. Now, your CPA, Certified Public Accountant, Enron, WorldCom, subprime loans, right? So we have this thing, it says, embracing ethics and morality. Look at that, right on the cover, okay? So again, relevant. This, by the way, is this month's, January 2012, hot off the press, okay? And uh, we'll look at a couple passages it has in here, somewhat discouraging to those of us who, uh, you know, think professionally. Uh, or just in general. Um, so, so the problem is the non-static nature of cultures, the fact that, that as we look at, at our environment, it's moving. And now let's just spend a few minutes looking at some of the movement. We have new people. We have new people, they're local people, in other words, we just hire new people. You know, some of us get white hair like me and retired, it's very exciting. And then the new people are like, you know, I like this group because it's a nice mix of, uh, of, of new people and less new. We never get old. Remember that. Okay. See you back there. Okay. Now, and then we have global. Okay. We, we start here in New Orleans and before you know it, we're in New York and then we're in Paris and then we're in Abu Dhabi and then we're in, uh, you know, in Mumbai, and then we're in Hong Kong, and, and you know, before you know it, we have all these people, and we have one company, and we do one service, and and we and it's a and it's a problem. Now we have new generations, and this is this is our issue. Now, 
We're going to do a little mini small group exercise here. Now we need, we need to keep it down to, oh good. Glad they started me early. Okay. We're going to spend the next three minutes. Let's do the same grouping we did yesterday, you know, sort of three or four people talk about this. Now what I want you to do is each of you has an experience. In your environment, work environment, which are the ones, pick three, that you think are most impactful in your culture? And then we'll go around and, and, and grab something, you know, a little bit of why. So which is the most impactful in your business experience? All right? So you got three minutes to choose three. Three for three. I like this. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we got size, just the whole scale of things. All right, in this column, do you have a choice? And you can reaffirm these, that's okay. In the middle. We had uh, new economics. Ah, uh, there we go. Good. Like, the Great Recession would have some impact. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, and you guys? You guys are right in there with go nine go. But you know, okay. growth, we could do nine nine nine, but that would be another <laughs> point. <laughs> but, okay. but growth also has its own problems. Sorry? Not only recession, but growth also brings its own problems. Well see that's exactly right. All right, those of us, you know, again who build company, we, we aspire to live in this in this world. 
And when you live in this world, you're, you're, you're adding all these people, customers, vendors, products, and things, and suddenly, oh my, you know, wow, I got ragged edges. And they have to be tidied up. And so, so mergers, you put United and Continental together, and you know, a new organization, much bigger. How's that going to look? How do I do that? You know, these kinds of things. I'm not going to talk about Cooper's and Life and Price Waterhouse. Yeah, we'll get there. Okay, any thoughts over here? We were sort of a mixed bag. Uh, I know in our company, um, new products is the most impactful. <coughs> Number seven. All right, now, that was great. Let, let's just... Let's just talk about what we did. What we, what we, what we did was, was we just highlighted the fact that everybody and every situation can be a little bit different. See, and that's, that's our challenge, and that's why the tools that you guys build are so helpful, because on one hand, we move from, from here to here, to here, to here, to here, you know, we're moving, it's always moving, and that's why, that's why we call it management. See, it's, it's management's job to manage the business in this transitional state that's constantly happening. Now, back in the 90s, we came up with this really harebrained idea that the only constant was change. Now, we did it in the context of the digital world. Okay, and then, then, then some crazy management people decided that, no, this was the new standard for how to run companies. And, and of course, how many of you like constant change? You know, you're always moving, you know, you get a new address every month. The answer is no, okay? We as people like things stable, it, it, but the world is not stable. And so, and so part of our challenge is, is to build cultures that handle change while preserving the stability of the organization. So we see that? That's, that's, that's the problem. That's the problem. So let us go to the next thing. Okay. Is it right or wrong? All right, let's just talk about this one. All right, now, I will read to you from the very fine CPA journal. They did a study. Now you have to understand, business people love studies. They just don't like the studies we've been talking about here for the last two and a half days, okay? Because they're called academic studies. We do studies of markets because we want to make money, okay? And so, I mean, you just have to understand that. You know, when you talk to people like me, studies are interesting, but can you tell me how I can make more money off of this? You know, help my people? I mean, it's gotta be, it's gotta be tangible. We gotta drive this thing to something that goes somewhere else. But anyway, they did a study, and here's what they found out. So they reported that 79% of the 18 to 34 year old age group, by the way, that's called the future. Okay, when you've got white hair like me, these are the future. We love these people, okay? They pay my retirement. <laughs> I've been working on them for 20 years. I'm very happy that the retirement thing's working really well, too. Okay, now. So that 79%, uh, that seems like a big number, 79% of the 18 to 34 age group said the standard did not exist and that the situation should always dictate behavior. Moral standards? Exactly. Moral standards. Okay, so let's go, let's take a look at this. So. The question, the question is, is ethics about right and wrong, okay? In other words, is it about breaking the law? Now, we, we got over here, number one, regs, regulation, regulations and laws, okay? So, so we put in regulations, and, uh, and everybody's going to follow regulations, so we're going to get behavior that we want, all right? Or is it about doing the right thing? or is it about broader social responsibilities? Okay, now this is the question. Okay, one answer is, it's um, maybe none of the above. Okay, now, in the spirit of interactive, right, we're intensive learning here, this is, this is interactive, we got a new problem. 
Let's see, do I have my problem? Let's see whether I have my problem. Uh, yes. All right, we'll, we'll go through this and then we'll do the problem. Okay. So let's leave that as the question. Okay, the problem is breaking the law, doing the right thing, so broader social responsibility. Now, these people have told us that our young people have different standards. Now, what you need to see is our social community has some standards as well. So let's take a look. Here are some problems that we can relate to. In the large corporate world, we can relate to these. Now, these are a little bit different. I could have chose Enron, WorldCom, and those guys, and I worked with all of them. <clears throat> and instead, I chose something that's a little bit close to home. That's PricewaterhouseCoopers. I am a PricewaterhouseCoopers retired partner. I love that firm. Okay, some of you work with them. I encourage that. But that way they can pay my retirement. I mean, you know, this is personal. Okay, the world of self-interest, so that's not, I'm not unbiased here. KPMG's nice, they're not that nice. Okay, but anyway, so we did this merger. We put two firms together, Coopers and Lightburn and Price Waterhouse. And on the date of the merger, the SEC showed up and said, Oops, caught a partner's hand in the cookie jar. It seemed that one of our very fine audit partners had been trading the securities of the company that he was signing off on. That's called the comp Conflict of interest, it's a violation of independence. We have rules about this. And so the, the SEC said, <clears throat> you, PwC, have to clean up your act. And so we created the ethics study for Price Waterhouse Coopers. Okay? And everybody had to take it. And you had to log in, and it was very cool. Remember, this was 98, okay? Dark days, okay? And we were right on that leading edge, and, we, and it was a simulation. Three sims to deal with the ethic issues that the SEC was worried about, okay? Thou shalt not have an interest in the companies you audit. Well, we all knew that. I mean, these audit partners knew that. Okay, they just, they just violated the rules. So, so we went through this, worked really well. Why did it work well? Because we educated people? No, because the SEC was happy. Okay, now I, I need you to hold that thought. Okay, I need you to hold that thought. Okay, because we're gonna come back to why it is immersive learning and the simulation techniques that you guys use have such value. Regulation is not a small reason for your existence, okay? Because I need, as the CEO, to be able to go into chairman of the SEC and say, listen, I can show you my people know this stuff. It's very valuable. Very valuable, okay? So that was that. Johnson Johnson's an interesting case. That case is actually written up in this book, which has been to too many uh, briefcase wars. Uh, but anyway, this book, uh, Business Ethics Today Foundations, and, um, and it's written up as an interesting contrast of the Tylenol case. You remember Tylenol, right? I mean, these guys were the guys, okay? They got one whiff that Tylenol had been tampered and pulled everything off the shelves. And this is back in 82, and, and everybody said, this product is dead. I mean, they are so out of it, short the stock, you know, the whole thing. And, uh, and, and then they put in new ceiling and all this stuff that we now have as, as you know, killer wrap. And, um, and then lo and behold, <clears throat> I don't know, it's back to 18 months later, it's number one product. Now, fast forward, 20 years, they have a similar problem. Not same, but similar. Response is different. Different response. Culture change. Culture change. Values didn't change. In other words, you go on a website, they got the same credo and all this stuff. We'll look at that in just a little bit. 
Anyway, and so, and so you know, suddenly we have hmm, interesting culture change, different response, different outcome, right? PwC, SEC's happy, they say good, you did the mayor culpa thing, now we like that. Johnson & Johnson, we're going to fight. FDA, unlimited budget, big war, not good, okay? Diversity training. All right, now diversity training's been going on for 25 years, okay? And we're still struggling with it, all right? And, and the issue there is, of course, it's litigation, all right? And how do you deal with it? Now, so we need to pause for a moment, talk a little bit about, you know, what are ethics? I mean, what are these things that we call ethics? Now, I would submit to you that it is helpful to separate ethics from morality. Most studies put them together. And so let's just pause for a moment, because remember, we're going to create a culture and we need to understand which side of the culture we're on and what we're dealing with. So in the company, ethics are the standards to be applied to evaluate behavior. Okay, now, for those of us of the dark ages, we love flip charts as opposed to uh, overhead. So let me go to the flip chart here and show you what I'm talking about. We have behavior. We have some action, okay? And we're going to evaluate this action. And the question becomes, what side of the line are you on? So ethics are over here, and we're looking at this behavior as management, as a company, and we're saying, do I like it, don't I like it? And so I have some standards here. Okay, regulator, looking at my company's behavior. They got some standards. Okay? Now on this side, I have the cause of the behavior, and this is the morality. In other words, this is the, my values, and what underlies my values are what created this behavior. Okay? And it's just useful to understand that we can create all the standards we want, and we send people to jail. Okay? But we, what we're going to wrestle with is this over here. This is the culture. This is where culture is. Culture is not over here. Okay? We need to embed culture in the people. And that's our challenge. And, uh, and, and, so, and so we just need to, to take a look now at saying, look at, you know, behavior is the consequence of an individual's choices and actions. And the important thing is to understand it's individuals. Now we can create a culture that encourages individuals to the point that you have to get rid of the enterprise. Do not be confused. Arthur Anderson does not exist today because the US government decided that the culture was so bad that they had to get rid of the enterprise. Now, I was there. I was on the board of PricewaterhouseCoopers. We're not interested in the big five going to the big four. Okay, we don't like each other, but we are totally not interested in the big five going to the big four. Now remember, PwC just got its hand slapped by the SEC with the same warning. We've been down this road. We know what's coming. These guys have an unlimited budget. And, it, and you serve the public good at their <clears throat> allowance. And so, and so we're looking at this thing, and we're shaking our head in our board meetings. We're saying, you know, Paul Volcker has come to them and said, listen, I will be your chairman if you will let me change the culture. And they voted as the board of Arthur Anderson not to let him do that. 24 hours later, the feds filed suit. $10 billion disappeared. 120 days. That's all it took. Arthur Anderson was gone. Never to come back. All right, now, then what's the point? The point is, is it's individual behavior, but we can create an environment that encourages individual behavior to such an extent that we have to eliminate the environment. Okay, and so, so this is important. Now, let's just talk a little bit about behavior development and again, this is, a, this is a CEO business guy's perspective as opposed to 
the, the, the research scientific. The, I live with this, okay? Behavior always starts with values. Remember, the person walks in the door, walks in as a whole person. You don't just hire the daytime person. You get the whole person, okay? And they come in with all their values. And then, uh, and then the values start with beliefs, okay? And beliefs start with experiences, faith, training, these things that go into the frame of reference that the person's going to apply in developing their values relative to a situation and the decisions they're going to make. And that's what we live with. So, which of these can I change? As the CEO of a company, what can I change? This is, this, I'll struggle with this. Now, in the US, we don't talk about this. Everywhere else in the world, we talk about this. I go to Mexico, I talk to the chairman of uh, Hoopers and Library in Mexico, we're doing some business together. My unit represents 10% of their business. Now, 10% of anybody's business is a big deal. And we have this problem. <coughs> and that problem translated into a culture problem that when I went home, I shut down my unit. Do not miss that. In the U.S., we don't talk about that. The rest of the world, we talk about it. And people walk into your office, and they walk into your company, and they bring all three. And do not miss all three. Now, now as again, as, as, as leaders of companies, we can change this, and we can change this, and these two can help shape this, and this can help shape this, and it's important. This stuff is important. And, and as I talked last night to some of the SIM distributions, you know, the, many companies know that this is right. And when they do SIMs about products, about programs, they're incorporating the values of the company because they can put these two together in a SIM. See, in other words, it's not rote. I can put these two together in a SIM and I can help make that happen. Now, Here's a quick cut, a little academic here. They say there are six stages of moral reasoning. Now, the reason I put this up here is as you're wrestling with this, you will hear about this, and the people you work with will think this way. I want to tell you that business people have a different view, and we have to have a different view, okay? So let's go through this. So, so fear of being caught or punished. All right, now, this is known as the, the standard of ethics is the law, okay? Ethics uh, being concerned for one's self-interest. This, uh, this is your modern thinking that people operate in their own self-interest, basic economic theory, okay? So, so this was the law, this is your basic economic theory, uh, being ethical because of peer pressure to do so. We like that. That's culture. Remember, if I can create the right peer pressure, I'm good, okay? Being ethical because there's a rule, regulations, a lot of standard. Now, now notice that these two are different in that, in that if I don't have a fear of being caught, then I don't care about this anyway. So this is fine, okay? And, and I will tell you that this is modern. This is the modern thinking. This is that point of relativistic. I'm not so worried about being caught. Okay, the ethical out of concern for the good of others. Okay, this is the golden rule. All right, so golden rule, ethical out of concern for a moral principle. Okay, now we would say that this is your faith in action type of thing. Okay, and, uh, and, and you know, it's simply the right thing to do. Now, stage four is generally viewed as where people get. We who build companies believe it's here. Do not miss that contrast. We who build companies believe that we and our companies operate here. And our mission statements, our value statements are all talking about this. This and this are given. We respect this as a part of what people bring in and we have to balance that. But we operate and we build our companies this way. Out of curiosity, what's the difference between six and four? 
The difference between six and four is that, is that we really want to do good in the world. Okay, we have, we have last night, we have the illustration of Cessna, okay? Cessna builds airplanes. They build individuals, they build jets, they build airplanes. Because they think that it's a very special thing for people to fly. I happen to be a pilot and, you know, I fly little airplanes and cool stuff. It's a very special thing for people to be able to fly. It, it is a blessing. And so they build them with that in mind. And they don't build them to kill people. Okay? And, and, and so when one of those little rascals falls out of the sky and crashes and people die, they're not indifferent. They feel bad because their moral principle of building a fine plane that transports people safely is violated. Okay? They're not indifferent. Sometimes it feels like they're indifferent. Not indifferent. Okay? Good companies are not. So they're just good question. Question. All right. Let me just... Uh, so... The frameworks create a view. Now, what's important to understand is that if you believe that this is the way that ethics work, then you'll create regulations. That's what's important. All right, now, here are, here are the way we set them. Okay, so they're set by community, and, uh, and so regulations, law, regulate morality, try to make it happen. Now, here's, and we're going to have a little hypothetical in a moment, okay? So we have this legislating morality. The problem is, is that everybody will tell you we're looking for a higher standard than the law. When we say ethics, the law is the low standard, it's not the high standard. So then that moves us up here, which is we say, okay, maybe there's a public reaction standard. So if I find myself on the cover of USA Today, oh, you gotta love this, okay? Let's just take a look at this, okay? So. On the cover of USA Today, is this a high standard? Super sexy. It does say super. <laughs> right? So, so, but you see what's happened is it used to be, you know, if, if, how would you look at on the front page of the Wall Street Journal? Okay, in other words, if they publish what you did, would you look good? You see what's happened. Okay, our community, you know, tabloid news is becoming more mainstream. Sorry about that. All right, now let's go through. Okay, what would your mama say? Okay, <laughs> you know, I mean, what would we, how does this look in court? Oh, that's a pretty low, high standard. Okay, <laughs> I just want you to know. But, but you see, this is what we're wrestling with is, is if it's not going to be regulation, because that's not high enough, then we gotta, we got to find some other standards. So we, we tried for some outside standards, so we got to go over and rule, you know, do unto others, as you have them do unto, unto you, and, and, you know, we saw that, that was level five. <coughs> do not miss that, that was level five. That was not level six, okay? And we got Milton Friedman, shareholder value. We're not real comfortable with that one, by the way. Even business people are not real comfortable. Let me give you a great story. Procter & Gamble has a wonderful chairman. I happen to be in a club with him. And uh, so he was speaking to our little club. And, and he said, look, Wall Street does not really like me. Okay, because, because we live in what we would call standard six. In this room, we would call it standard six. And so we're not the high growth people. We're not the most profitable. We ain't got the best margins because we are balanced. And so, you know, our, our shareholders, they get a good return. <coughs> and it's a consistent return. And it's gonna be a consistent return over another 100 years. That's our job. See, that's not this. See, that's not this. And we just need to understand that, that, that we wrestle with these values. Now, I got a task for you. Okay, because you're all sitting there thinking, oh, that was cute. That has no meaning at all. But you are in New Orleans. I think you are in New Orleans. How cool is that? Okay, and you are in the French Quarter, which you are. And you're standing out on the corner of Canal. And you want to cross. But the light's red. And there's no traffic. What are you going to do? Small group, two minutes. Let's see how you do. 
This is going to be interesting because this is what we live with in business. Maybe it's a helpful sign so that, so that, you know, we, you know, look both ways, right? It's Maybe. an encouragement. It's not a rule. Maybe. I didn't break a law. Maybe we're also making the mistake of making an assumption. God. Hello, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because at home, I wouldn't do this. Then where's your home? Vancouver. And... If there was a policeman within three blocks, he'd find me. It's <laughs> astounding, right? I mean, some people enforce ability at a level that's quite impressive. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, so you know, so I was I was looking to get a little bit of that, and so that would be what we'll call individual experience. Okay. In other words, we gen we in New York, where I have my office, generally find that people from the Midwest stand and wait. <laughs> They're so nice. <laughs> that way, as New Yorkers, you just get ahead. <laughs> okay? You know, and it's the same thing with driving. I mean, you leave New York for about two hours, you know, get slightly over the border in Pennsylvania, 
of state New York. It's a much more wonderful world. Now, we just pass all these guys. They're all lining up two miles ahead of time because it says, you know, the lanes are going to come together. And you're fascinated by the electronics. <laughs> so, what we need to understand is that in many, many business situations will feel exactly like this. So when you're, when you're working with a company, and when you're running with a company, you have to know where all the stoplights are. You have to know these things, and you have to work with your people to figure out whether you're in Vancouver, New Orleans, New York, Wichita. I mean, you've got to figure this out because you can't be, you know, getting jaywalking tickets at the crosswalk. All right, I mean, I didn't put you in the middle and say, well, you gotta go you know, a quarter of a mile to get to a light. I put you right on the corner. This was an easy one, okay? And yes, we all walked. But we're really not sure why we walked. And so let's just go back a little bit to trying to figure out, so what are we gonna do now? You're the mayor of this town. And you want to clean up the jaywalking. What are you going to do? See the problem? Pamphlets. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, this is, this is our issue, okay? We've got regulations and we got rules, okay? And, and, you know, I mean, we put those stupid signs up there so you guys would know, don't walk. We've got the hand going, the blinky thing, you know. I mean, we're trying to help you out. So what are we going to do? Get the police on every corner? Write tickets? For right? See, in other words, we're just moving through those ethics. We're forcing people, if we go back here, we're forcing people <coughs> up the chain by using these thought structures in order to try to get the behavior that we want. Remember, let's call this what it's supposed to be. I want right behavior. Okay, I'm not looking to balance my budget. That's a whole other theory of regulation and enforcement. Okay, I'm looking for the right behavior. Okay, and so, so I just need us to understand that this simple little illustration goes to the problem that these companies have. Okay, and every one of you has your own. Okay, we have the jaywalkers. And they jaywalk for a variety of reasons. And, uh, and, and we need to help them. Okay, you had a question. Yeah, I was gonna tie it to uh, immersive learning. If we, uh, given the example, say you do a public uh, education uh, about the consequences of jaywalking. Right. Right, and so they can see the ramifications of, uh, we, were, we, we kind of discussed, well, what would happen Maybe there is things. Maybe there was a, a a kid at the crosswalk who saw what you did, and you know, then did it on their own. And then, what would happen? You know, the next time. So it was like, well, you know, there. That's a social thing. See where I'm going? Right. Right. See, right. see, I, I need everybody to hear what was said because it was splendid. Okay, that, that when we train, you know, we try to invoke a measure of this, you know, goodness for others, you know, consequences for ourselves, okay? You see, you see we're, we're wrestling with multiple dynamics of this framework. And we will do this because individuals that come in function at different levels in this framework. Now, what we need to understand is that culture it's about taking all this diversity, all this richness, and allowing it to function together to serve and deliver services in a profitable way to the community. That's what business is about. And that's what we struggle with. Is that, you know, we like to clone them, remember the IBM, if I went to Black Tire and my motor hat, and, you know, there he is. That was 50s, okay? And the world was a much more unified place. Today is very diverse. And we accept all of this, but we've got to figure out that I got one guy that grew up this way, I got another guy who grew up this way, I got somebody else thinking this way, so I got somebody, you know. I need them to be able to come together. 
and form a company that uh, that really works works well. So good observation. Good observation. Yeah. Have you ever seen a company where the ethics and morals are actually flipped, where the CEO and everyone is so unethical and so immoral that when someone comes in and wants to stay at the higher level, that they are almost run out? Yeah. Yeah, let's not miss that. Okay, one of the things that I will tell you as, as again, I am speaking to you uh, as somebody who, who likes running companies and building companies, not as you know, as, as, as somebody who's here to train you, okay? Do not miss the fact that being ethical is not necessarily the key to success. This is one of the hardest things for us in America to understand. And it's not that we define ethics differently. The world has lived and functioned extremely well on lying and cheating and stealing. Okay? There's a book that was written in 1904 that's really interesting and it, and, and it shaped this all out and I completely agree with it. That, that really, before the last, they call it the Industrial Revolution, the way to create new success and fortune for yourself was brigandry. Okay? Now, not to pick up on Afghanistan, but if Afghanistan, uh, you know, has basically run on brigandry. You know, warlords and, and, and these kinds of things. Much of Africa runs on brigandry. Okay? Now, I got to go and speak to a group of African presidents on these issues. And, um, and, and you know, my studies of Africa, it was really pretty interesting. They do $3 trillion worth of business. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Three trillion is not nothing. It's not nothing. Okay, it's just it's not business as we would define it in this room. Okay, it's very much engaged in in a modified form of burgundy and stress and lying and cheating and pilfering and these kinds of things. And and, and it's a culture that accepts that. Okay, so their ethics are just different than ours. And in, in speaking with the presidents and prime ministers and, and members of parliaments and other groups, you know, they acknowledged it. And they felt bad about it. And they talked about it amongst themselves as to what they were going to do. There were 200 in the room. And, um, and it was, you know, it's a light to be amongst them, the nicest people on the planet. I mean, the world of nice people, nice people. But they have a barbed wire in every house. And I, I observed to them, it's really interesting, you guys use a lot of razor wire here to keep people out. Generally, we use it to keep people in. Sure. Do not miss that. That's a culture. Okay. So, good questions. Let's let us uh, let's take a little bit of a look at, at what we're dealing with now. Okay. Now we're drilling down. That was the whole social community. You guys all walked. Okay. You didn't wait. I mean, what can I say? All right. Now, let's let's flip over and take a look at a wonderful company. Now. What you need to understand is these, these companies that we are talking about, other than Arthur Anderson, that got killed. And even then, when I started, it was a truly the gold standard. In 1980, Arthur Anderson was the gold standard for accounting firms. We all looked up to them. Now, I was a technical expert, worked with Wall Street, and any time I needed technical material, I would call my national office and they would be send me some Arthur Anderson publication. I would say to them, I go to the library. What do you mean I'm going to send a Goldman Sachs some Arthur Anderson publication? What are you, stupid? And they said, well, it, they do the best. You've got to go with the best. Well, okay, you know, they might be some clients of Arthur Anderson. I don't know, you know. And, um, and so anyway, so it was really fascinating. So the same thing with Johnson & Johnson. This is an outstanding company and it's passion. Its passion is in that, and it has been that way for over a hundred years. That's a long time. Okay? So, so this is their website. And so let's go and look at their, 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 their ethics. Okay? And, and so they have a whole list of ethics things that they want to work on. 
So we have environment, we have social, we have governance and economics, and, uh, and they have an overview of what we do, our board, the transparency. In the overview, I got more transparency, human rights account. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you're the person in the plant that puts the little band-aids in the box. <laughs> this is your company. You want to read all this stuff? Right? All right, there's supposed to be a hundred, I don't know, machines, you know, they ain't working, you know, the red light thing, I mean, yeah, okay, fine, you know, hit the machine, you know, okay, now, I, mean, I don't know whether that one had a hundred or not, I'm not counting it. I mean, who could tell? A hundred's a lot. Right? See, this is, this is what our CEO is worried about. They want every, every box has to have a hundred. It says it has a hundred, it has to have a hundred. This is our values, this is our creed, this is what we do. This is what we do. I have a little company that makes widgets. It really makes widgets. I mean, it's the coolest thing, all right? You know, little pieces of metal, they take flat steel, they turn it into stuff. I mean, it's just, Amazing. And it's done in New Jersey. And we know you can't do any business in New Jersey. And so they do this in Jersey. They've been doing it for 70 years. They make a million different widgets a year in New Jersey. You know how many are right? A million. Everyone is right. Everyone is right. Now you got yourself. $20 billion company, and their passion, because every box has 100, doesn't have 99, doesn't have 101. Gotta have 100. But I gotta get it from this website into that person's head, so they stop the machine, make sure that this one has 100. Meanwhile, of course, you know what a supervisor's gonna do. What are you doing? Stop the machine! We're gonna make budget! We're crazy! That's, that's our challenge. Okay, now, the challenge that we have is, is that, you know, this, this was good, okay? A lot of stuff there. And, and, and now we have, you know, we have more stuff, okay? So we took each one of those and we wrote a little memo, okay? Now these memos are written to the same people who read this. <laughs> okay, so they don't read this, okay? So they Twitter, all right? You know, 144 characters, that's, that's a lot, okay? They're not reading this. This is your job. Your job to get this into something that feels like a tweet, okay? Because that's all they're doing. And we need them to make sure in that box there are 100 Band-Aids. And if they're not 100 Band-Aids, that they have the power to intervene. Now that's culture. See, that's culture. And and so, you know, I just I wanted us to have a little bit of a feel for when we go, see all this stuff is regulations. And so, you know, our, our organization is trying to build regulations. And and so we're adopting these draft standards, the mission statement, company values, and code of conduct. We may have SEC requirements, and we're trying to do all this, put all this in place. It's cold. It's cold inside, it's cold outside, and we've got to give it life, okay? So we have indirect standards. This is walk the walk, and oh, by the way, when the light is red, you don't walk. That's why we use that illustration. You see, the executive has to say, no, we stand here at the corner, we wait. And if the executive's not standing at the corner and waiting, I can tell you, the guy in the band-aid box, smack the machine, move him on, okay? This is top down. The challenge is getting the mission statement, all this stuff, into the day-to-day -day of the people. And so that's what we're running into. So, so we took a little bit of a look at Johnson & Johnson. They have these credo values. And if I had another hour, we could go through it. And you'd all be sleeping. All right, now let's do, now we're moving into, all right, let's build the culture. Let's build the culture. Now you guys touched upon this, but let's just reaffirm it. All starts 
tone at the top. <laughs> tone at the top. It all starts tone at the top. Okay, now, do not miss the fact that the tone at the bottom can change tone at the top. It's just not likely. Okay, everybody understand that? It's yeah. just not <coughs> likely. Tone at the top. Now it starts with the board. And if the board won't intervene, not happening. Starts with the board. Second, the board will appoint the executives. And the board and the executives will then stand at the street corner. Okay, so, so Bob, chairman of uh, P&G, he says he gives this speech 100 times a year all over the world. Culture of p and It's his number one job. It's his number one job. Not his number two, number three, or number four. It's his number one job. 100 times a year. He's chatted with us for a couple of hours, got on his chat, flew to the next place, same chat. Chat doesn't change, culture doesn't change, country doesn't change. Same chat. You think that Broadway has actors? Good CEO. You can give that chat, it's fresh. It's fresh. Every time he gives it, it's fresh. I ran a worldwide division, a couple of different groups, Waterhouse Coopers, SP. I gave the culture chat every quarter, every office, everywhere in the world. It's my number one job. And if your executive doesn't accept it as their number one job, you guys write all the same you want, and they'll be walking. The light will be red, and they'll be walking. Okay. Evaluations. Remember the hierarchy of ethics? Evaluations is the lowest form. Right? Because I'm catching you. I'm catching you, I'm not going to promote you, I'm going to coach you, I will, you know, right? I'm watching. Lowest form. Okay, bottoms up. Bottoms up is the next thing. So first is at the top. You've got to have the tone at the top. You've got to have these things. You've got to hire the right people. You've got to have the right values. Okay, a whole new art for HR is evaluating the people on their values when they come in. You know, we're doing some of the big whatever thing, and, you know, it's all very interesting. But unfortunately, for those of us who hire thousands and thousands of people a year, we have to have filters, okay? And we use filters, and we count on filters to help us get the right values. Next thing is we've got to have training. First training has to start day one, hour one. You come in, you're getting your ID card, you're getting all these things. That's when we start with the culture. Culture starts right there. Yes, we want that W-4 form for your withholding filled out accurately on time. Remember, it's accurate and on time. These disciplines. If you're not doing that, then I gotta, you know, we need to deal with it. Next, we need systems. Companies need systems. A million people around the world need a system. Okay, now, done right, CEO can pretty well know what's going on everywhere in the world. It is spooky what we can know. Okay, my current team. Nice people in three offices, and they will tell you, we're never sure whether you made it up or knew it when we come to a meeting. It's spooky what we know. It's our job to know. Remember, what's our number one job? Culture. What's our number one thing about culture is behavior. What's our number one thing about behavior is the values. Okay, that's what we worry about every day, every hour of every day. Is that we're not worried about this, the red light. Red light is inconvenient. I just want to know whether you walked. And I am watching. I am watching. I'm watching the guy who's counting the band-aids in the box. Okay? I am watching. And if I hear some customer complain about getting 99 band-aids in the box, I am not indifferent. But that's a warning that my people are walking on a red light. That's a warning. I don't get a lot of warnings. All right? I'm paying attention. So I need these situations, these systems. 
Training in a part of evaluations is a big part of it, okay? Now, the next thing I have to deal with is I have to deal with ethics level one. Remember one? Pain. Put him in the stocks, okay? Right? The fear of being caught, okay? If, if the person doesn't have the fear of being caught, then I didn't hire the right person, okay? So let's just understand, all right? You know, there are brigands out there. They're happy to be caught. I mean, how many of you guys watch Pirates of the Caribbean? This is the day you're almost caught. <laughs> I'm not afraid of being caught. I love this stuff, okay? So, uh, so, so, you know, there are people like that, okay? And, and so, so, you know, we go down these things and we have to know where they are. And we, now, due process is part of culture. Okay, now the Romans, we know, reigned on fear, right? Good companies do not run on fear. Notice I didn't say successful companies. I said good companies. There are plenty of successful companies that run on fear. They're just not good companies. Okay, they're successful. And then they've been around for a long time. All right? Good companies have due process. Okay? We have evaluations, we review them, we have to process them, and, and we communicate that we love our people and, we, and all this stuff. And then we have actions and tolerance. Okay, now the problem is you can have remedial training, you can have punishment, you know, you're on furlough, you're, you know, your pay is cut, you're demoted, you know, all that stuff, or you're terminated. Okay, now at certain levels and certain actions, you need to be clear about this. The issue is due process should lead to action and it should lead to an outcome. Here's the problem. Everybody should know the ground rules. Right? You're standing on the street corner in New Orleans. Do they care whether you walk or not? Is it a law or is it just a helpful guidance? Look both ways. You don't know. So maybe it's not important. Okay? You see, we as a company have to put all this into the hearts and minds of our people. All right? So we want to look at now applications for you. Okay, remember, I'm a business person. So if we stop here, you could all say, that was cute, but you know, can I have some more coffee? Okay. Much better to say, okay, so how do we make some money? Because remember, making money is about adding value. All right? I'm not trying to take something. I'm sorry. You know, these guys need help, and oh, I could help them. So let's help these people, okay? Tone at the top, okay? So they need to understand the options and the use of it. Remember, we, the board of Price House, Waterhouse Coopers, are staring the dragon in the mouth. The flames are coming out, and we're feeling very hot, okay? I mean, they do have us with the hands in the cookie jar. There's no escape, all right? And the dragon says, I have a shield for you. If you will use this shield, my hot breath will not consume you. Arthur Anderson decided not to use the shield. See the problem? We were not fooled. I can tell you, it was a very interesting board discussion because, you know, there was the usual radical kind. Oh, we can fight them! Those guys are so outrageous, they don't understand our value to the community. I mean, they got to understand that we are important people. We are, we just had one loser down there and that's it. The rest of us are good. Good news, we had a good chairman. He stood up and said, listen, pal, it's a dragon. And he's after us. Do some sims. Get everybody checked off. Dragon goes away. Or at least goes back into the lair. <laughs> Never goes away. So, so this was very valuable. So for those of you who are trying to work at this, get to know the professions and the companies that are under regulation because they all need this, because they all have their dragon. Okay, now, it's a training tool. Do not just 
you know, miss this idea of Bob McDonald, the head of PNG, doing his hundred speeches. You cannot replace the personal executive side of culture. You support it. So it's a training tool. It gives it gives you that undergirding that you need. I liked the chart yesterday on the mini thing that said, listen, you got some learning, you go, Shh, and we all know, I mean, come on. I mean, we live with this stuff. Remember, we pay money to have you guys come and do cool stuff for us, and we know what the outcome is. We are totally not confused. We don't need to do research. We know what happens, because we live with this stuff. We look at the check, we look at the return. We know, all right? Now, this idea of saying, listen, we could do a few follow-on sims, you know, you guys all got the Blackberry things, you've got the iPhones, we could do this, and then suddenly you would have, you know, we could reinforce this thing and you could really get some culture change. You know that it ain't one time, never change culture. See, you guys got tools. We don't know about these tools. And we're struggling. I don't even have my Blackberry on me. I mean, I feel like I'm short, but you know, I'm not on Facebook. I mean, my, my assistant may have me on Facebook, they actually do. But notice how that works. My assistant has me on Facebook. I'm not on Facebook. My assistant is me on Facebook. Okay? So, so we know about this stuff. See it, use it, be helpful. Okay, benefits, feedback on values. Do not miss this. We need feedback on values. Now, I've chatted with a bunch of you. I need to encourage you to think about this idea that you can help me know what's going on in my people. Because every year I'm getting a thousand, ten thousand new people from all over the world. I don't know where they are. I know I don't know what their values are. I mean I know kind of what because I'm trying to hire right, but you can you can tell me what people are thinking. Because when they do sims they're checking one out of three. Okay? You can tell me that you know what option is chosen. Huge, huge value return. So I need to know where my people are. Remember, my job is to make them successful. If I don't know where they are, then I can't help them learn not to walk when they're in Vancouver. I'm not so worried about New Orleans. But Vancouver, we just learned. Don't walk in Vancouver, okay? And so, so there's just you know some real powerful kinds of things that you can do now. <clears throat> Bottoms up systems, okay? This is this is training people to help them. Now, I'm going to try to see whether we can do a quick sim. It's a little bit of a wrap up here, because I know you guys. Let's see, there we go. Okay, now this is a course. I had the privilege of writing these sims for a Reformed Theological Seminary, and Next Learn created the Sims in this course. It is tremendous. So let's see, we got week 10, immersive simulation. Here we go. And, uh, and we got some, we're gonna enter the simulation. Now if any of you watched, you notice I didn't check the box. See, I'm a derelict, okay? You know, check the simulation entry. I don't do that. Okay, so we, we've got some reading, academic, okay, we got our little continue button. Hello. So at this point, you should have completed your reading assignments and no. listened to the okay. professor's now lectures for this week's... Now, you guys, you guys all recognize this, week, this guy, right? Oh, totally. It's lovely. Okay, so now we're going to go also, to, to the specific... Now, let's yes. Okay, so now you recognize how I'm doing this. You That's feel not, this, and we're just going to go through this. And I, I, I'm just that, clicking our way through. Next, he asks what some... He's got these questions. So, so what we're doing is this is designed as, as training, right? Knowledge. And now we're going to do some situations. Good work. Besides... Uh, good work. I guess right on that. Next. Okay. We have more questions and... Uh, nice job. More nice job. Next, he asks what... To get to Oops, too that's bad. Not, got that right. Let's just keep going here. Okay. That's correct. Oh, I got that one right. In addition. <laughs> okay. Now. 
Hi, Hi we, this is I'm thankful that you had a few minutes situation. to talk today. I'm really having trouble understanding what's happening in the medical profession right now. It seems in order to get started as a doctor, you have to jump through so many hoops. To be honest, I'm wondering if it's ethical. Did you know that doctors study for three years after undergraduate, do two years of residency, then do from one to four years for a specialty, and then get paid very little for the first few years? So you're tr in this one, you're trying to advise this person. Right. Yeah, I, I wrote this. <laughs> what concerns me is that so many interns feel overworked and underpaid. Some of them even say it feels like slavery. Well, I wouldn't quite call residency slavery. More like indentured service. We have to serve in order to get our license. It's just that working 14 to 16 hour shifts, day after day, night after night, seems unfair. A few of the people I work with think that all hospital employees should be treated and paid equally. Do you think it's fair that interns are paid so little while CEOs make so much? Alright, let's do the answer to the question. That's right. It can seem unfair that some make more than others, but it's true that sometimes the rich enrich others by creating jobs. So we need to avoid sweeping generalities. What's possibly unjust is if the rich are enriching themselves by intentionally and systematically impoverishing others. For example, it can be unjust if five families own 95% of arable land, leaving the other families to struggle over the remaining land. Of course, this depends on how the families have acquired their land and in their treatment of the other families. Also, when Tom says he thinks all people should be treated equally, keep in mind that equality and justice are hardly synonymous. Equal treatment can be equally unjust. All right, in the spirit of time, let us just pull this together. I wanted to give you that as, as a little bit of an illustration. And that would be a, as you can see, the, the questions, I can tell you, I, I get those questions today. I get them from my clients. To get them from my people. We struggle with compensation. It's just one of those things. You can see there was a lot of values in there. Nice interaction, did a nice job pulling that together. And, um, and, and so you, you know you, you have the, 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 the culture counselor that responds to your input. And um, you know, kind of a nice little tool to begin to help us deal with cultures, particularly across the world. Um, so, a lot of training. Um, now, there's an important thing I need for you to understand. You know this, but come back to it again and again. Staff level, management level, senior management level have different culture roles that need to go into their thinking. Now when somebody gets promoted from staff to management, and from management to senior management, good companies train them. Because we know that things change. And if they bring in all the same baggage, it's difficult. I had a situation where we had to let somebody go a week ago, and needless to say, all of his peers feel like, you know, if he can't make it, well, what hope is there for me? Now, I had this discussion with a senior partner 33 years ago. And he said, Phil, you are a staff person. You need to trust the organization. And when you become a partner, you'll see what I see. But you need to trust the organization that we're here to build people. And that it is in the best interest of this staff, you know, the senior person that we've exited, that he goes someplace else rather than staying here, that it will be better for him and his career. And so we need to train our management to see at the level that they are. And we need to encourage our staff to the same. All right, the cost of culture erosion. Now, Let's go through this a little bit, and the cost goes into this cost-benefit analysis. 
What I need you to understand is that you, you, your sail is either a dragon, okay, this is called a need. I need it now, okay? It's the best sail. It's the best sail. It's the shortest sail. It's the most functional sail. <coughs> Value, I just want to tell you, as, as your favorite, Guest lecturer's CEO, <laughs> we don't buy that. Only on a bad day do we buy that. We buy need. You need to convert it into a need. Okay? Risks, regulations, all this stuff. It's what we buy. We buy needs, and uh, and and so it's if these are some of the things that you're gonna run into, inertia is gonna be your biggest impediment. Bob is doing his hundred speeches a year. You're never going to get him to buy the idea that he doesn't have to do those 100 speeches. That's inertia. Okay? So inertia is the biggest impediment. Budgets are relevant because you guys are not less expensive. The illusion that Bob is cheap, and since I pay him anyway, he might as well go get in the jet and go do his 100 speeches, is the illusion. Okay? And so, so there is there's real value there. So that's it.